You're listening to Policy Room by SPRF. Welcome to Walking the Talk Sustainably. Sustainability or sustainable consumption in a very layman term is described as using commodities and puts energy in a way that the use minimizes the impact on the environment so that human needs can be met today and tomorrow both. So in this podcast, uh, we have two speakers. It's me, Akshata and Paris. I'm a research associate at Social and Political Research Foundation, and Paris is an intern who specializes in climate change and sustainability. Paris, would you like to talk more about your work? Hi. So my background with sustainability actually goes back to uh, when I did my BSc in geology from Delhi University. And this is a sort of degree on how the earth works, essentially. After that, I also pursued a master's in climate change, environment science and policy from King's College London, where I focused particularly on climate policy and uh, did my dissertation on agricultural policy in Punjab and how that can be made more sustainable. Okay, great. So Paris and I today are going to talk about sustainable consumption. And the first thing that we want to talk about and define is about sustainable purchasing practices. So around us, we look at a lot of advertisements and a lot of practices going on about using bamboo toothbrushes or metal straws saying no to plastic bags but is sustainable purchasing practices just limited to those or does it go beyond these few things okay so what you actually discussed here in terms of using bamboo toothbrushes or metal straws or saying no to plastic bags i feel like a lot of that was stuff that was related to waste generation And I feel like waste generation is such an easy way to, I don't know, I guess greenwash sustainable consumption and get away with it. And we're going to describe what greenwashing is in in a bit, but it's just this, this sort of whole idea that you can pick up a few things that you think you want to do sustainably, but have the entire process still being very unsustainable, which obviously is not the ideal way to go. So I'd like to say as far as sustainable consumption is concerned, while waste generation is a major element of it, particularly for consumers, it actually does involve a much broader set of topics, you know, such as water use and energy use and transportation use and all of these things, which are a bigger part of the supply chain than waste generation is, to be very honest. And the fact that waste generation is sort of this output that's visible to us, which is why we can do something about it. This plays a very big role in terms of the actions that we take. So basically, there are so many elements that sort of end up constituting a supply chain and resulting in sort of subsequent emissions that it becomes very difficult for us as consumers to see these processes taking place because for us, ultimately, what we see is the end product. And because of that, it's much easier for us to act on waste generation than it is to act on the processes that take place in the making of a product. For example, one of the things that I learned in college was the concept of virtual water, which is essentially all of the water that's required into producing unit quantity of a product. For example, if I want to buy an avocado, I have to consider how much virtual water is used because, of course, I obviously cannot sort of go and count how much water is used, but the amount of water used in growing it, the amount of water used in transporting it, processing it, doing all of those things. So that also resulted in a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. But essentially, as responsible consumers, what we need to do is not only figure out the waste generation part, but also try and buy products that either are certified as sustainable and in general that we know are made from sustainable practices. Okay. So yeah, that was very insightful. I mean, we mostly always look at the waste generation part and try to minimize waste, but then there's a lot of other things that go into making a product. And maybe if we could uh, figure out what the sustainable practices are into making each product and move to those products, it will be a good contribution from our end. Talking about green products, we all know that they're quite expensive. I mean, it's good to think about why is that and how would then privilege and socioeconomic status play a role in our access to sustainable consumerism. Let's start with why green products are very expensive. The idea behind that is that demand for green products and sustainable products is very limited at this point. So the lesser the demand, the lesser there's a chance that the products are going to be mass produced. And if the products aren't mass produced, that means it's very difficult for you to bring down the per unit input cost for each product. 
which obviously makes it much more expensive than other products in the market. And also the fact that because it's not mass produced, you should be putting in extra care for each unit. So that makes it much harder for you, for you to reduce the input cost per unit. That's what in economics we call as the economies of scale. So you can't achieve the economies of scale there because there's so much more diversification. Apart from that, there's also issues with the storage, the handling, the marketing, and the distribution of these products because they ultimately end up factoring into the limited demand factor as well. Because of the fact that we have limited demand, we need to market it much better. We need to distribute it and bring it across to more number of stores. And generally, at least for grocery items and food, fruits and vegetables, what we do see, and food in general, I think what we do see is the fact that non-conventional food items and organic food items don't necessarily store or handle or travel that well. So extra care needs to be taken in terms of, you know, keeping them fresh or keeping them edible for much longer. So that's where a lot of the money sort of ends up adding in as well. And finally, certification is one of the things that factors in to the price as well, because for farmers, at least getting certification for your product being either organic or sustainably grown or fair trade or something like that really involves like paying a lot of money to, to get the certification. And that obviously adds up into the input cost, which jacks up the price for the product. So that's, that's why green products are expensive. Other than that, what we sort of discussing is how privilege and socioeconomic status plays a background in accessing sustainable consumerism. And well, all I'd like to say is if there's people that can't afford buying conventional products, there's obviously going to be people that can't afford buying green products, which are, which are much more expensive than conventional products for the most part. Also, for a lot of cases, people just are unaware of the sustainable alternatives that exist in the market because either you don't have enough publicity of that product or people are just very comfortable in using what they're already using. That becomes very difficult for them to then switch to a completely new product, which will not be in their comfort zone, you know, because you need to take so much extra care for it and stuff like that. Finally, I think one thing that sort of, at least that's discussed in the behavioral sector quite a lot is this idea of the intent action gap, which is essentially the gap between a consumer's purchasing intentions and their actual behavior. So while as a consumer, I might be very concerned for the environment and I might go ahead and say that I do definitely want to buy the sustainable product. As a rational consumer, ideally, I wouldn't go ahead with it because it's costing me so much more money than regular products. So this is this whole idea of your intention to buy it versus your actual capability or versus your actual going ahead and buying it. So that's one of the major issues that the green market faces as of now. Also, I feel like consumers always have this idea that one action is never enough, you know, like they feel like structural change needs to happen at a much bigger scale in terms of manufacturing and in terms of promoting sustainable products, because just one consumer buying one metal straw is not going to make all the difference in the world. But I feel like somebody has to start somewhere. So ideally, if you start making a difference, your neighbor will too. And if they start making a difference, their neighbor will too. So it makes it makes it much easier for you to have this collective action, which can always translate to policy change or structural change later on, you know, because once you show that there is enough demand for a particular product, there's obviously going to be more supply of that particular product as well. But as a general advice to consumers, one of the easiest ways that you can consume sustainably is buying local produce. So essentially, whatever is available around you in farmers markets and smaller markets around you makes it much easier for you to consume sustainably because you cut out on uh, the transportation costs and the transportation emissions a lot, which makes a major difference. Other than that, just changing the way you consume a lot of products in terms of what your diet consists of. Does your diet consist of a lot of things that need to be shipped from different places or even air freighted at, at some point in time? Or does it consist of like a lot of meat, which sort of, as we know at this point, generates a lot of per capita emissions as compared to vegetarian diets and stuff like that. So I feel like those are decisions that need to be made, of course, given your economic condition and given your social and health factors considered.
All right. So I completely agree with you. I mean, green products are made in such a way that the inputs are also expensive, and then the time that goes into it, and the money that goes into making them, automatically makes them expensive. And once the demand increases and the supply follows, we could expect the prices of green products to go down. But then again, consumers have this notion that they alone buying uh, sustainable products or green products is not going to make a huge. impact and that might actually stop them from buying these products adding to the non affordability part of green products too and yes uh, obviously i mean there is this moral imperative to take responsibility and buy green products in whatever way you can for example you mentioned about local uh, farmer markets they might produce more organic uh, fruits and vegetables than some supermarket would and that is something that we can do and th- those are certain things that we'll have to figure out for ourselves that which products which local products are green products and are cheaper too so that is i think there's a information gap over there which cannot be filled maybe by marketing because these are just small farmers but yes it is our imperative to try to understand how we can gain access to these green products so my next question is again something related to the point that you said that individuals when we shop we think that we're not going to make all the changes and then how difficult would that make to inspire change in a lot of people also knowing that the richest 1% of the world population are responsible for carbon pollution twice as that of the poorest 50% right then how would a person like me or a poor person think about buying green products sustainable products when we know that we are not the one not the ones who are contributing majorly to say the climate crisis that's actually a very good question and a very valid question indeed because we are definitely not in the just 1% so there's this whole sort of sense of why should we pay for somebody else's emissions that comes in when we talk about stuff like that but there's this one term that you mentioned which is basically the moral imperative which i feel like should should probably factor in when we are thinking about sustainable consumption as well because i feel like it is our moral imperative to make sure we consume in a way that sort of saves enough for future generations and makes it much easier for future generations to have their needs fulfilled as well so at this point the only thing we can depend on in terms of our sort of willingness to buy sustainably is probably going to be our moral imperative and how much ever our economic condition can help us afford green products as far as the richest 1% of the population emitting twice of the emissions of the poorest 50% goes i feel like the answer to that most definitely has to be through public policy because markets definitely haven't been able to control what they buy and how much of it they buy so probably actions like maybe tax uh, taxing sort of luxury products and luxury carbon essentially like suvs or business class flights private jets and all the other luxury items is probably one of the quick and easy solutions to reducing those emissions and other than that it will also make it much easier for people if cities have greater sort of digital and public transport infrastructure and other sorts of public amenities that are low carbon in nature because then it's easier for us essentially to become sustainable without putting in too much extra effort because that's the way our cities amenities are built essentially so i feel like it, uh, when it comes to people like us infrastructure definitely has a big role to play in terms of how accessible sustainability becomes for for a lot of us essentially but yeah i feel like public policy becomes a very important solution on a city level essentially because that's sort of where most of our lives are as well as the effect that sort it of carries on to state and national levels as well i feel like that's probably something that we should be looking at when it comes to sort of making it sort of building on the moral imperative point i feel like it is our moral imperative to sort of ask for policy change and to mobilize and to advocate for a cause that's very close to our hearts and with the newer generation i feel like that's definitely happening with climate change so once you have the power of collective action behind you it becomes much easier for you to advocate for policy action 
I completely agree with you, and especially the point where, where you talked about the Taj generation is particularly more aware about these things and is ready to advocate and lead collective action. I think that's that's completely true. And in fact, we are, I think, even more eager to shift to sustainable products than I have seen from the previous generations. About the public policy part, I think, yes, markets do not always lead to optimal outcomes and the government has to enter the market and make sure that the incentives in the markets are correct so that we don't over exploit the environment and the natural resources that we have. And yes, we also do have some moral imperative to make sure that we leave enough to the future generations. It's very, I'd like to interject there. It's very interesting that you say that we are much more eager because I feel like that's sort of essentially the, the gist of our generations, which is basically we are much more eager, but much less able to do it because we definitely cannot afford to do it given this current economic state that we're in, you know, given the job market that we have come into and stuff like that, how our affordability has gone down as compared to past generations. But yeah, I think much more eager, much less able is probably <laughs> probably the tagline for uh, Gen X, Gen Y. I don't know what generation are we at this Right, point? and that, that uh, leads me to the next question that I have. In a hypothetical situation, even if prices of sustainable goods are optimal and sustainable goods are available and they're affordable. Do you think behavioral change will pose a challenge? So as we discussed before, sustainability definitely is a very conscious effort, you know, the effort to sort of gain more information, the effort to try and find out what sustainable alternatives are there, where those are available, if there's an easier way to gain access to them, all those things. It's very conscious effort. Behavioral change definitely plays a very important role in terms of getting people to shift to sustainable consumption. I'd like to bring in the the concept of intention action gap again. I recently read a, a study by the Harvard Business Review where they tried understanding what consumers' behaviors were in terms of sustainability. And they realized that in, in their target group, when 65% of the people wanted to buy the product, 25%, only 25% actually went ahead and bought it. So, so the idea that there's this gap between what you want and what you're able to get or what you're able to afford plays a very important role in terms of, you know, your, your sort of consumption patterns. And also the fact that you always want to stay in your comfort zone. So it'd be much harder for you to shift to an alternative, which let's say, doesn't, okay, let's let's consider the example of deodorants, okay? So instead of buying a deodorant from a store, you want to buy a natural deodorant, which you probably get in the form of, let's say, soap. It becomes much more difficult for you to change your daily habits in a way that you can incorporate this particular thing into your daily schedule. And humans are not good at embracing change. We know that by now. So... For people to sort of be sustainable definitely is not easy. It you, you need a lot of conscious effort from your side to be like, this is going to inconvenience me in the start, but it's going to have a good effect on the environment overall. So maybe I should just go ahead and do it. Which I think actually happened in the case of plastic bags, to be honest, because it became so easy for us to just keep getting plastic bags in stores and stuff that we never said no. But once people started sort of paying for those bags, it became much easier for them to get them from home. And while that was an effort to be sort of made in the start, you would obviously rather do that than pay extra for a, for a plastic bag. So at, at some point, it just ends up becoming a part of your daily routine. So it's not that hard to continue doing those practices in the long run. Once you've made that immediate sort of change that takes you a little while to get habituated to. So that's the sort of place that requires the most effort is getting habituated to newer sustainable practices, essentially. Also, awareness does really play a very big part in choosing sustainable alternatives. So the fact that I would probably know that there's five sustainable alternatives to milk and somebody that can't afford milk on a regular basis probably won't be able to know that because for them, Milk is what they've been looking for. And 
to find a sustainable alternative is definitely not on their list of priorities you know so like privilege and the fact that this awareness sort of plays a very important role in behavioral change so we shouldn't essentially expect behavioral change from somebody that can't afford it which which i think again factors into that 1% in the 50% gap. While saying that, I also think there are a lot of traditional practices and sort of practices that have been carrying on for generations that are way more sustainable than the practices that we use today. And we've sort of just phased them out because they're not modern anymore and because, you know, we have all these shiny alternatives. I feel like a lot of, uh, at least in India, in a lot of villages and stuff, there's a lot of practices that are sustainable in their essence. So to sort of promote those practices on a larger scale in in places outside of the village is probably a good idea as well. Yeah, so keeping all that in mind as consumers, I feel like we definitely do need to go ahead and make a conscious effort if we do want to pick up sustainable practices because we can most definitely put it all on on the production aspect saying it's not really our fault that there's so much emissions happening before we get the product, but I feel like when there are alternatives available, why not use them? I think awareness is a very important factor that plays in. I mean, even if the prices are right and goods are available, behavior and force of habit can just make you use unsustainable products. And a case in point is sanitary pads. There are a lot of sustainable products, sustainable alternatives available in the market right now. But since the usage of sanitary pads is such a personal hygiene element that it becomes difficult for females and also a bit scary to sort of try and shift to other sustainable uh, products. So even here, I think, I mean, even if in the future, sustainable uh, alternatives to sanitary pads become less expensive and they actually there are things like menstrual cups which are pretty pretty cheap than sanitary pads still there are women using just sanitary pads and not say menstrual cups so why is that happening and i think behavioral change is the answer to that question it's just that we are habituated to a particular thing and it's tough for humans to it's it causes cognitive strain to actually shift to something that we are not used to. And as you pointed out that, yes, we need to make conscious effort and the whole moral imperative part that you need to make conscious effort and try to shift to these green products and other sustainable products. Yeah, so you actually gave a really good example of sanitary pads and sort of sustainable alternatives available for them, but how using those sustainable alternatives might not necessarily be the most comfortable alternative for a lot of people. When we discuss that, I feel like there's a few processes that sort of can change how we how we buy sustainable products. And a lot of studies have basically found that there's three, three main things, which is one is basically using social influence, as I mentioned before, which is basically, so say somebody else uses a sustainable sanitary alternative, sanitary pad alternative, and tells me about it, tells me that they've had a pretty good experience and using that product makes them feel like they've sort of made a difference in terms of the kind of waste generated. I feel like I'd be much more likely to pick up that product and use it myself if I hear good reviews from other people or if I, in general, I hear many people talking about it because I feel like that's what we do as consumers. We, we hear other people talking about something really, you know what, we want to explore that as well. So social influence in general is, is probably one of the easiest ways and one of the most important ways to get more people to consume sustainably because if your neighbor does it you want to do it too you know just just to get on the bandwagon apart from that shaping good habits over a period of time is is definitely one of the slightly more long-term processes but definitely something that has great outcomes in terms of sustainable consumption which is i know i might not have a market for this product right now but if i keep promoting it, if I keep going after consumers about it, I can ultimately end up shaping the future of how this product will be used and end up shaping the future of the good habits that this product will sort of encourage, which I think will probably end up hopefully being true for electric vehicles and the difference that they'll make in terms of emissions and stuff like that. Because I see a lot of people now 
picking up the whole idea of um, buying electric cars essentially and switching to renewable sources of energy let's say um, solar energy or because i know so many friends who have solar panels on their houses now and it's definitely not a short term thing it doesn't is doesn't happen immediately it takes some level of investment it takes some level of being financially independent to do that but ultimately ends up sort of encouraging your kids to do that as well so you're shaping good habits not only for yourself but also for the future generations which is pretty good and both of these factors sort of help you in leveraging the sort of domino effect i'd say where if one person does it the other one wants to do it too as millennials i think one of the more important things is for us at least is the fact that we we favor experiences over ownership so the idea of using a sustainable product definitely has much more of an experience involved than than using conventional products because for the most part here you're directly interacting with producers and sort of that that's what i've seen in all these sort of organic shops that i've been to in farmers markets that i've been to there's so much more of an interaction with the producer of this commodity that that already makes me feel better about what i'm buying you know and uh, the fact that me buying something makes me feel like i can make a difference in the world automatically makes me want to buy it even more so that that's one thing that sustainable companies have been focusing on is sort of trying to encourage more people to partake in the experience first and then maybe consider the ownership of the product which to me seems like an excellent marketing campaign to be honest <laughs> yes so even i've noticed how companies that are producing organic products and green products how they use their marketing and how they use um, influencers on social media to market their products and sort of market the experience of the products and i agree with you that that social influence and good habits and even like herd mentality can actually help in shaping the thinking around sustainable consumption now talking about sustainable consumption and waste generation i am starting to think about the whole covid situation right now and how waste generation from plastic packaging and thrown away masks or gloves increased and how the usage of water increased suddenly so how do we make this whole structure of sustainable consumption which i agree is not very well developed in our country right now but how can we make sustainable consumption resilient to such external shocks like a pandemic that's actually a very heavy question that you've asked me there I feel like we're all still recovering from the fact that we in a pandemic and discussing about anything sustainability related just seems like a secondary thing when it comes to the fact that people are losing their lives over something. But I feel like in a lot of webinars and stuff that I've been listening to recently there's this whole idea of a green recovery and how you can how you can deal with pandemics or how you can deal with external shocks in a more sustainable manner. So in that context I believe number one we really do need like a sustainable base. and that comes from years of sort of using your experience with sustainability and years of practicing sustainability to sort of be able to essentially be resilient to external shocks you know in order to keep producing and keep consuming sustainably to be very honest i feel like external shocks because you never know when they come and when they go there's always going to be this sort of sense of uncertainty so even if we aren't immediately able to sort of adapt to that it always makes sense to offset what we've done later you know to learn our lesson and to be like you know this is the amount of waste that we produced during this particular period when we were going through a pandemic what can we do now in about two things what can we do about the waste that we generated can we is there a way that we can recycle all this waste is there a way we can use it to make something else and secondly is there a way we can offset the emissions that were caused during a pandemic so yeah, there's essentially two things we can do there one is think about the way that we can deal with the waste that we've generated and number two how we can essentially end up offsetting for all the waste that we've generated one of which is basically doing something proactively which is as soon as we know we're entering into the shock we try and adapt to it we try and make sure we find the most sustainable alternatives for all the products that we are using and the second which is more of a short term thing which should be more of a short term thing for us but i feel like that's what we're going to be doing right now is essentially retroactively doing something about it which is 
okay, now that I know I generated all this waste, what can I do about it? You know, which shouldn't be the ideal approach, but given the fact we don't necessarily have a sustainable base or a sustainable structure in place as an economy, we can definitely sort of learn a lesson from the waste that we've generated and hopefully try to find ways to offset it and try to find ways to essentially give back to the environment, if I may say that. <laughs> but yeah, I, I would definitely suggest the proactive solutions more than the retroactive solutions, more so because they'll have better long-term Im impacts. But as of now, let's try our best to do what we can in terms of short-term short -term actions and retroactive actions as much as we can, I guess. Ultimately, I'd just like to say that while this podcast has discussed what consumers can do to focus on sustainability, we most definitely aren't the only ones that should be focusing on it. The onus is definitely not only on us. A part of it is we can't, we can't completely give up ownership. We can't completely say we're not responsible for this show. I should react on it. I feel like we need to take ownership of where we are responsible, but we also need to make sure that we make other people aware of where they are responsible, which is where the part of the producers comes in and how we need to encourage producers to take charge because there's only so much we can do as consumers. Completely agree with you there, Paris. And I really like uh, the point that you made about that all the waste that has been generated during COVID is now done. And there was also some reduction in pollution, I'll say, because of vehicles, but I'm sure it couldn't offset the amount of waste that was created. So I think it's our responsibility that we look back and look at all the waste that has been generated, all the pollution that has been created and then compensate for that in the coming months. I'm not sure uh, how much of this is being thought about or done because yes, we are not a community or we are not uh, a country that is sort of built on sustainable consumption and production. That is something that we are heading towards and our immediate short-term action that we undertake should be something to offset the amount of damage that we have inflicted on the environment. And yes, consumers, we do have a moral imperative to take part and to advocate and to ask for public policy changes and to ask for green products. But yes, the entire uh, burden of moving to sustainability does not completely fall on consumers and producers actually do have a role to play here. And I think that is something that our next episode in the series will be focusing on and how producers can uphold sustainable consumption. So I think this uh, podcast has been extremely fruitful in understanding what sustainable purchasing practices are and how can we go beyond and think beyond waste generation and bamboo toothbrushes. And the whole idea about the dream products are expensive and they are going to be for some time now until there are some incentives from the government to the producers of green products to reduce prices or if there's something, if there's, if there's increase in the demand and so the supply and then the prices fall down. But until then, I think there'll be this affordability issue and that intent action gap is going to exist. But still, we do have some sustainable alternatives which are actually cheaper than the conventional alternatives. And I think as consumers, it is our moral imperative to try to shift to those goods. Also the whole behavioral uh, change issue. But again, that is something, as you said, it has to be a conscious effort and we have to be responsible to gain more information about things and try to recognize green products and try to shift to them. Yeah, I feel like I couldn't have summed that up better. You, you sort of discussed it perfectly in terms of the actions that we can take and the actions we should take, you know. Big words, those are can and should, but I feel like we've, we've had our time being irresponsible consumers. And at this point, putting in conscious effort is, should be the least of our worries. You know, that's something that should come to us naturally, given how concerned we are for the environment and, and given how so many people and so many organizations and so many producers are also actively putting in an effort to, to encourage sustainability in both production and consumption. Yeah, I can't wait to see what your production podcast holds for us. 
Thank you for being with us on the episode one of the series, and we hope you enjoyed it. And our next episode is going to look at production and sustainable consumption.